Hi, and welcome to another Cordis Conversation. Uh, I'm Cordis Mundi Artistic Director and Founder Rick Rosen. With us also is our Musical Director, Tim Harrell, and our esteemed guest for today, Dr. Tom Lloyd. Hi, Tom. How are you? Good. Good to see you again. Good to see you as well. Yeah. If you don't mind... Me on Zoom. Or on Zoom. For anyone who doesn't know a lot about Tom, we should do, we'll just tell you a little bit about him. We should also let you know that uh, Tim is the current accompanist for Bucks County Choral Society, and I'm a former member. I don't know if you know. <laughs> <laughs> My hands aren't getting used much. <laughs> but you're warmed up, right? The next one is good. Uh, and in addition to that, I'm a former Bucks County Choral Society uh, base one singer as well. Um, Tom Lloyd is, is a classical conductor, a composer and singer who currently serves as the canon for music and the arts at the Philadelphia Episcopal Cathedral, something he's been doing since 2010. And he's also the artistic director of the Bucks County Choral Society since 2000. He's the, an emeritus professor of music at Haverford College, where he directed the Combined Choral and Vocal Studies program at the Combined Haverford and Bryn Mawr Colleges for over two decades. The premier recording of Tom's 70-minute uh, choral theater piece, Bonhoeffer, was nominated for a 2017 Grammy in the Best Choral Performance category. Just a little bit more, Tom holds degrees from Oberlin, Yale Divinity, Yale School of Music, and the University of Illinois. We should also add that Tom's son, Jeremy, is also an active composer of musical theater and founding producer composer of the electronic R&B band, Marion Hill. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> all that right? Yeah, that's, that's all. So, Still true. So let's talk about BCCS. We've all, um, you know, encountered a, a different set of, of, of situations here to address this first part of our season. Tell us about what BCCS is doing. Well, we, uh, we've done a number of things since the shutdown. The, the first thing that I keep coming back to and, and count my blessings is that we, our last rehearsal was the same night in March as the rehearsal in Washington by the community choir where 50 some people got infected and two people died. Um, I mean, they already had infections going there at that time, but um, we, I remember very clearly that we had some folks who had heard enough about it to say, you know, uh, anybody who's got a cough or a cold really should stay home. Of course, nobody was even thinking about um, asymptomatic spread or anything like that at that point, but we were, you know, we were lucky. Um, so we kept in touch by Zoom after that on a weekly basis and then went to a monthly basis. We had a, um, a website, a grant that finally had come through after waiting for about six or seven years to redo our website. And so that became my first project uh, together with Bill Stefanowitz. We hired his company uh, to, to do that. So I partnered with him to redesign and redo the website. And we had had on our schedule a concert with the Heritage, uh, Philadelphia Heritage Chorale, which is a, a mostly, uh, predominantly African-American choir, just as we are predominantly white choir. And we had a concert planned for them for June of next year. And uh, suspecting that we might have to postpone that a year along with the rest of the season, I'm optimistic that the fall things will begin to get back to normal. Um, so what could we do? And we also were thinking about Christmas being a time when uh, people really need the comfort music of Christmas carols. Um, and I didn't. Uh, I was hesitant to do uh, the virtual choir thing with a large choir because, as as you know, it's very labor intensive, and especially in a large choir, um, generally people sing in large choirs not because they want to be exposed, <laughs> <laughs> and also because they like singing with other people, um, <laughs> and and do and doing a virtual choir thing, you know, you're recording by yourself at home with maybe only looking at your choir director and looking at you sternly and, and calling him. <laughs> I, I afterwards to say, you know, could you do that again and, and the B flat make it a little higher? Um, you know, so, but 
it occurred to me, you know, that, that it, there were some protocols that had emerged that it was safe to sing outside with six feet distance around you in masks, um, as long as you didn't do it for a long time. And uh, that the main challenge with that is rehearsal, because rehearsing is really hard to do, and generally you need to do that indoors. And so what could you do in that situation? And it occurred to me that rather than doing the fancier carol arrangements that uh, we normally do at Christmas time, uh, we would do the simple ones, the simple harmonizations of, of Christmas carols uh, from both of our repertoires because Christmas is a big deal for our choir because we always have a big concert at Our Lady of Guadalupe on Sunday afternoon. And uh, we started doing one Saturday afternoon at, at uh, St. Paul's Lutheran in Doyle's town. And the Philadelphia Heritage Chorale and Donald Dumpson have an annual Christmas concert in the Kimmel Center that draws uh, a few hundred singers and lots of a uh, huge audience. And so we both had this hole uh, that, that needed to be filled somehow and repertoire that was familiar that we could do without rehearsal. Um, so then the question was, uh, well, what can we do with that? Can we make a video out of it? Uh, that would be sort of a, the reverse of a virtual choir video. We would be shooting um, what, filming. I'm trying to avoid using the <laughs> weapon words. Uh, we'd be filming everybody actually singing together at one time in one place. Um, or in this case, uh, two places for almost all of it because uh, being an hour apart, travel would be a challenge and uh, people would have to uh, be carpooling and so on and sitting in a car with somebody else for an hour. And in both our communities, that's, that makes a lot of people uncomfortable. So we, we have wide age range in both communities. We have health conditions. And there's particular sensitivity in Philadelphia and the African-American community to the disproportionate devastation that's had on that community for a number of reasons. Um, so we tested the waters with, with the uh, members of both choirs first to see, you know, what's the comfort level? Are we okay with this? With the idea that if any point along the way, um, we it was apparent we wouldn't have enough people to do what we wanted to do, that was it. That's okay. We're done. We don't have to force it, in other words. So, um, and, and the other thing we had to test was, can you do a decent recording with people singing outdoors in masks? <laughs> so, so Donald and I and uh, Rich Tolzma, who uh, had worked with Donald before and was a college friend of Sue Johnson, our assistant conductor, um, expressed interest in, in working with us on the project. And so we made a field trip to Doylestown uh, to, uh, and sang in front of um, Salem UCC Church. And we, we visited the Mishner and Mercer museums across the street from each other on Pine Street and made some audio, re audio recordings primarily is what we were concerned about um, with masks on, just singing simple carols, a quartet. It was me, my wife, Jane, uh, and Sue and Ed Johnson, her husband. Um, so we were the, the guinea pigs and uh, we tried something that Steve Mallon suggested, which is another one of you guys, uh, which was to sing into our phones yeah. in order to uh, get past the problem of uh, singing outdoors and having no uh, acoustic feedback. Um, and that worked. Uh, it worked uh, amazingly well. So we said, okay, it's technically feasible. Uh, we had a, a film uh, director who, one, the thing about Rich is he's, uh, his approach is not just to say, okay, what do you want to film? When do I show up? Uh, the first thing he wanted to do was create a treatment as they call it, which is basically, uh, what are you doing? What are you, what's, what are you trying to do it for? What's the message? What's the purpose? What's, what's, how's it pulled together? What's the raison d'etre for doing this project? So that it, it already from the beginning has kind of an arc to it. Um, and I had a lot of ideas to throw in there already and, and from Donald as well. Um, the choirs will be uh, sharing uh, half 
of the hour, basically in terms of the number of carols. The full choirs will sing together, but separately at the beginning and the end. There'll be 40 singers recorded singing uh, Silent Night at the end with candles and O Come All You Faithful at the beginning, including the Wilcox desk cant, which we're gonna record. <laughs> Tim's uh, playing on the St. Paul's organ. Um, and, and, and put that together. So a little bit of virtual thrown in there because he's not obviously bringing an organ out to the, to the uh, in front of the Mercer Museum. Um, but uh, there'll be a procession at the beginning. Um, there'll also be um, filming of people getting out of their cars and putting their masks on and walking to the procession and, and leaving silent night and taking their masks off. Um, so that we get, you know, the full context of what it is, and also give people a chance to see faces. Uh, there will also be four or five uh, spoken segments that will be taken from interviews at at the filming site, or from uh, several of the um, Zoom rehearsals that we've had, uh, which have been wonderful. Um, and then each group uh, will produce three octets. Uh, which can be done without the phones, just with local microphones. Um, and for us, one of those is going to involve uh, four of our Singing for Seniors singers from Pine Run, and will be filmed at Pine Run, uh, which we were glad to be able to pull off because they're very sensitive about uh, people from outside coming on campus. And so we had to minimize the numbers and, and all that. And it was a really beautiful spot to film there. Um, and then one of the octets for both choirs, one that'll sing record in Philadelphia and one will record in Doylestown, will be a mixed octet in that there'll be four singers uh, from each choir. Uh, and they've been meeting on Zoom a, a couple of times. We just met uh, last night for our, our last meeting together and Donald will conduct one piece in Philadelphia. I'll conduct a carol in, in Doylestown. And this is the one time where singers from both choirs will actually sing side by side in, in both locations. Um, in addition to that, to give it variety, because each of these carols is only three minutes tops, um, we'll have two solo selections from each choir, uh, and those will be recorded indoors um, at, at Arch Street Presbyterian Church in Philadelphia and at St. Paul's Lutheran in Doylestown, and our two solos will be uh, our two two of our most recent winners of the Voices of the Future, um, uh, kind of Sierra Safran and Grant Nolte, uh, two wonderful uh, singers. And then Donald's will be, uh, he has some unbelievable solo voices in his ensemble. His, his ensemble has a full range from uh, people who are active solo career people to people who uh, learn by ear. Um, and an incredible amount of variety so, they do. So how and when, how and when are we gonna be able to see this? Uh, well, it'll, the filming is next week on Tuesday in Doylestown, Wednesday in Philadelphia, and then uh, we go to work on the uh, editing part of it with the goal of having something by mid-November. Um, we have a certain TV station that's been following this and has promised to give it very serious consideration if we, uh, once they see what we actually come up with. Um, and given that uh, Rich Tolsmas had things on national PBS stations and so on, we think the quality there will, will, be, will be good, but we can't announce that until that's actually done. But it will also be shared every which way on social media. Um, I mean, the main thing is for our audiences uh, to give a sense of connection uh, to us and uh, for the choirs to be able to connect with each other mm -hmm. uh, and to just for a brief moment have people see people singing these um, iconic carols that mean so much to people on so many different levels um, together in, in the same place, same time. And I should mention, so I won't leave them out because they'll be mad, um, the Philadelphia Bronze, who would be on our normal Christmas concert, are part of this as well. Uh, again, in the interest of giving variety, uh, they will be, their eight ringers, uh, but in order to make it efficient to rehearse, they're doing two four ringer sets of three short carols, three from the African-American tradition and three from the European tradition. 
and those will be sprinkled throughout and recorded uh, inside because outside is hopeless for bells. Um, and and that was uh, that group was founded by um, two of our longtime singers, Alan Reagan and Cynthia Reagan. Really, um, okay. I didn't know that. I didn't realize. And, okay. and of course, Cynthia is a longtime. Uh, employee of Walmart Bells and so you know their, their family is totally immersed in Bells and it's an amazing group they performed with us last year for the first time so um, it's going to be a really really nice mixture and we'll have something to offer and what more comes of it from that you know the main thing is is uh, connect our singers and our audience. Let's let bravo 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 let's take that connection let's talk about let's talk about your choir again it's been a really unusual time um, how have you found it working with your choir, uh, with individual members' spirit, with individual members' sense of group, um, greater or lesser participation, greater or lesser fear? Do you know what I'm getting at here? Well, I mean, our, our contact has been just on, on Zoom, and usually 30, 40 people will, will come out for an open Zoom session, we keep it to an hour and there's no agenda, it's not a rehearsal. Um, and, but I always show a video of a, pr a previous rehearsal or performance at the beginning and the end. And that usually means a lot to people. In fact, um, I'm grateful now that I got the bug about I don't know, 15 years ago, maybe it was when you were still with us to uh, do video recordings before performances in order to, oh. you know, you know the, we make like the, the internet is sort of the enemy of live performance, but in some ways, uh, you know, if we can tap into the visual element of that, it's a way to connect because you can show the audience what you're working on or what you're rehearsing, you can, the excitement of the last week, the dress rehearsal when the orchestra and the soloists come in, and it and it creates uh, it makes people feel like they're part of the process and not just seeing the final product. So we had you know like 85 of these videos uh, on my computer, and so once a week we've been trotting them out. Uh, we also had videos from our Cuba tour, um, videos uh, from other past performances. Uh, there was a, a couple of musical theater performances we did at the. Uh, Delaware Valley College Auditorium that we had videos of the complete uh, show. So, um, and we've been trying to reach out to our senior communities. We've had uh, meetings with some of the leaders of those choirs just to touch base with how they're doing. And of course, they always ask us, "When do you think we'll be back?" <laughs> you know. <laughs> let's let's jump on that one. Do you think? And I'm not sure how I feel about this as well. Do you think there are things from the skill set that we've all been forced? kicking and screaming into starting to learn. Do you think that there are things that we'll continue to use once we get back on stage? Yeah, I think, I mean, in some ways, we won't really know until we get back. And, and at that point, probably a lot of things will, 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 will realize that, oh, I'm doing something now that I wouldn't have thought of before. But I think, um, just the effort that goes into connecting it all and just singing it all. Um, I mean, like even in these, uh, um, you know, singing Mast and Outdoors and the trials that we've done of that and doing it on Zoom, Donald and I, you know, we've had good conversations. Um, there, there is an immediacy of people seeing each other so close, you know, closer than we would in rehearsal, mm -hmm. face to face. Um, that uh, I, I think also a huge benefit will be that once we finally do get back and we finally can perform in large groups and for audiences, uh, people are going to treasure the live performance experience even more. Mm -hmm. I mean, this whole situation where we're totally reliant on electronic transmission of performance, I think, you know, in, in all of these many ways that 20, 25 years ago, we didn't even have access to, mm -hmm. I think is only emphasizing to people how much they miss the live thing. I, I would agree. And Tim, I know you want to get in on, on this next part. Um, I want to ask you kind of a pedagogical question, pedagogical question. How, 
<laughs> the feet. You know that word, teach, right? um, teach me, teach me. <laughs> one of the things we've noticed in, in Cordis Mundi has just done a set of recordings and um, it, to varying degrees, each member of Cordis Mundi was, um, let's just say, not thrilled with what they sounded like. Um, we've talked to a number of people who have kind of advised us that the obvious thing was, which is that these are muscles like any others and that when we don't use them, they go to hell. Um, and we're finding, you know, to some degree that's true. There's a degree of musicianship that covers you part way, right? But the sound quality is, is certainly not what it was. Tim, do you want, what, where I'm headed with Tom is, is any thoughts you have about what we can do here. Do you want to comment on this? I do, because what we've talked about with our guys is that, I mean, I found it for myself that, first of all, breath control has been compromised because we're not able to you make as efficient use of the breath because our muscles are not in shape. And, you know, of course we want a quick fix and there's no quick fix because it takes months for the decline to happen. But, you know, what do you suggest that we do that would help strengthen those muscles again? Well, I mean, the best thing obviously is, is to sing right. uh, at home on your own to do vocalises and stuff. I mean, um, Jane and I are, are both singers and we, we sing, on Zoom uh, morning prayer services, along with uh, several of our other um, paid singers at the cathedral. And so that gives us reason to, to crank it up, so to speak, and, and get back into it. Um, I mean, the best thing is obviously, if you can, if you sing at home and you have music that you can sing that you love, uh, it doesn't take much, it, just a few minutes, three or four times a week is enough to uh, to get you there. I, I think the, the, the main thing is going to be a, a, a sort of a sports analogy. When we finally do get back, uh, we can't start with two and a half hour rehearsals. <laughs> if, we, if we do, the following week, nobody's going to have a voice. <laughs> you know, it, we're going to have to break it in. We're going to have to go easy. Um, we're going to have to vocalize a little bit more and get people in, into a, a really regular routine. And I think that'll come back. I mean, vocal overuse is, is more problematic than vocal underuse. And I think, you know, we can, there are, there are ways to bring that back. And I think it helps to have a goal to shoot for. If you know that you're gonna have a rehearsal coming up in a few weeks and you're gonna have a concert a couple months after that, that gives you motivation to say, okay, I'm gonna do it because you, you don't wanna uh, beat yourself over the head with it and make yourself feel bad if you can't keep it up or make it feel like it's drudgery. and you know, I really hate doing this and this is no fun. I used to love singing, um, you know, but find ways that, you know, uh, different things work for different people, but, you know, singing along with uh, recordings that you love of opera or musical theater or art song, um, you know, just whatever um, can get you into a, a mood. You know, if you have a piano, I mean, for me, sometimes I have to, you know, get myself off the computer and push myself to the piano and just play pieces that I love. Uh, pull out art songs that I love and and sing them. Um, we're lucky to be able to play for each other. Um, but it, you know, sometimes we have to push ourselves to take a chance and, and just, you know, the uh, uh, just a little bit singing a song or two uh, to remind us that, okay, I do have a voice there and okay, I can't, you know, it takes me a few minutes to sound decent at all. And then that only lasts for a minute. Um, but um, Easy singing and starting with humming um, and starting with, uh, with E vowels because E is the most, the closest, uh, going between E and A for the high palate and the closed folds. Um, you know, there's, there's things that you can do. Um, I mean, certainly humming is to be commended. If, if you're humming, um, you know, and hum along with things and just get, in, get used to letting yourself do that mm -hmm. and do it with connection to the breath, not pushing a lot of air, but connection to the breath. Um, that's helpful because you're putting your folds together and they're vibrating smoothly and you're getting a nice um, uh, tilt from the larynx, uh, which is estel, uh, uh, estel voice training language that I love. Um, so it's all, you know, I think I'm more hopeful about that. We're just gonna have to be 
patient. I remember the, the uh, Haverford uh, faculty, we were uh, told that there was going to be a new softball team starting up in the summer, summer league. And so I signed up because I love baseball. I thought, this is great. And, and went out and played in the outfield. And my shoulder the next day was, you know, unbelievably sore. And this is from somebody, you know, I was conducting a lot and, you know, using my shoulders for that, but throwing is a different thing. And if you're not doing it regularly and you don't break yourself in, <laughs> then you pay for it. Right. You didn't, you did you? You didn't embarrass yourself at the ball game, did you? Uh, no, I just hurt. Oh. <laughs> I think I got a hit or two. Excellent, excellent. <laughs> and what you're commenting is so helpful because what I wanted to say is it seems easier for me to try to psych other people up when, when we've had our Zoom with Cordis to talk to them about singing and what to do to help it. But but it's not helping me so much you know we're in the we're in the field of encouraging others so what is it we can do the three of us to keep our own um interest and excitement and stay motivated too uh, well, Tim, I, Tim, I'd, I'd like to suggest one thing before we hand it back to tom which is that when we have our rehearsal on monday with course let's kind of advocate this this hum humming yeah. right because I think that's a real easy on-ramp for our guys. I'm sorry, Tom, go ahead, please. No, well, and the idea that as if we're part of a regular performing group, um, we're used to having performing goals. Yes. You know, you have a concert, you have a certain repertoire, and that motivates you. Uh, but I've always found, especially if I'm feeling particularly pressured, particularly challenging concert to conduct, that if I allow myself time at the piano, to play old favorites from back when I was a student and still have enough under my fingers to enjoy or to sing some art song that, you know, I'm not going to be performing. Um, but just to perform, sing for the joy of it, play for the joy of it. We really need to give ourselves uh, that anytime, but especially now. Uh, an interesting point there. We, we've done a court. Well, I did a court conversation with Craig Heller Johnson. And, and one, <clears throat> one of his points was that our tradition is so based on perfection, you know, you know playing each mm -hmm. note and each rhythm and each everything exactly correctly. And that that's part of the, he was suggesting that's part of the trauma that we're all going through. Yeah. Right. Our inability to do that. And his point was, forget about that for now. And, and, you know, focus on the kind of things you're talking about, kind of the core essence of of why we're making music, you know, and, and what the good is, you know, this is not the time for us to be perfect. This is the time for us to, to share. Yeah. 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 And to, and to keep the joy that we have uh, in doing it. I know I, I can tell just looking in the eyes of some of the older singers in the choir, um, but I can tell that they're thinking, you know, when we're back singing again, will I still have enough voice to be able to sing? I think that's the one group that, um, as a, you know, is of some concern in terms of, of will, you know, will my voice is rusty, will I be able to get it back? Well, in, in some cases, voices that are already on the far end of aging, um, that may be tough, that may be limited in terms of what they can uh, accomplish. Um, whoever it is, whether it be Dr. Tom Lloyd or someone else who, who presents for us kind of a methodology for getting back, that's gonna be a very valuable contribution. I mean, in terms of how we start our voices, so as, I said, as you said, starting with humming, you know, and moving from there, um, that's gonna be a very valuable resource, I think, you know, um, as, yeah. as it codifies. Um, it's not like you have a lot of spare time, Tom, but um, we do know that you're a composer. Um, do you want to talk about Bonhoeffer a little bit? Do you want to tell us a little bit about um, any current projects, any current compositions? Any... Sure. Is that is that noise um, carrying through at all? Not that I'm aware of. Okay, good, good. Just some kitchen noise. I just wanted to share. <laughs> um, that adds <laughs> Come on. Yeah, it's been interesting. Um, uh, one thing that happened over the break was that I heard from a uh, music critic in Holland 
who wanted a copy of the score in order to be able to review uh, the recording. Um, so some professional journal in, in Holland is, is reviewing. He said it, it would be published in, in Dutch um, and there wouldn't be a translation, but he could give me the gist of it. Um, but that he, he thought, you know, that there would be great interest in it because of the particular approach it takes and because of the relevance of uh, in, in an age of new authoritarianism uh, of, of Bonhoeffer's legacy in that regard. Um, in terms of, of recent projects, uh, what's unusual for me is that I'm in the position of having two pieces totaling about 100 minutes of music that were to be performed this year and won't be performed until next year or the year after. Um, one was the, the uh, I guess you could call it a cantata, the piece that was going to be performed at the end of month, at the end of March on the um, concert with the uh, Fourier Requiem. Uh, I wrote a piece with the identical orchestration um, of the Fourier, the, the original orchestration, no violins, um, so low strings, two horns, uh, timpani and harp. And it was called Appearances, uh, and the texts were drawn from three medieval mystics, um, Teresa of Avila, uh, Hildegard von Bingen, and Julian of Norwich. And there, um, they all had visions of the risen Christ. And so um, I put those visions in the, in the words of the soloist, soprano soloist, and the choir, um, the words from the gospel passages about the various resurrection appearances. Um, just to, because it's the subject of the connection between uh, the finite and the infinite, uh, this world and, and whatever the next is, is one that's uh, an open question for me and one that I explore within the Christian tradition. Um, and there's an amazing variety of views of that. There's not one view of what uh, what this is all about. Um, and, and these three women uh, had such vivid imaginations of it that I think spoke to our time. So that, that was a really intensive uh, conclusion period because uh, for large projects like that, I mean, a 40 minute piece and three, three movements with orchestration, um, you spread it out over a long time and you do other things at the same time generally. I, I, the two sabbatical years I took for two different projects uh, practically drove me crazy because I, I have trouble being that laser visioned on just, just writing. But there comes a time, and especially in a large piece, that you have to be all in for about six weeks in my experience where you are every day putting in hours so that you tie things together so that you're thinking you know in the same mind as the piece because if you write it over a long period of time which you have to do to do a long piece um things can be very become very disconnected and you know so you have to tie it together somehow and that came, you know, right up until the month and a half before the performance. I was already rehearsing the choir and, and then finishing up the orchestration and the solo part. Um, and then it finished. And then two weeks later, COVID hit. And all of a sudden, all that stress and pressure I was putting on myself was, was for naught. So, um, but in a way, it, it still felt good because I felt like I'd come to a point where, okay, th this is the piece. And I'm happy with it. I don't feel the need to go back in and revise and revise and revise. Good. And uh, I ended up, the only thing I've written since then is um, a, a short uh, Good Friday anthem to uh, a text, uh, a medieval text that a retired priest in the congregation, Andre Trevathan, gave to me a year ago and said, you really should set this sometime. And uh, so, I, I kept putting it off and putting it off because of this project. And then when COVID hit and Good Friday was uh, you know, a few weeks away, I thought, okay, I need to do this now. Um, we were still streaming and singing in church at that time. I got people the music. They learned it on their own. We came together, uh, sang through it once with masks for, you know, worked through it for half an hour and then sang it on Good Friday morning. Um, and it, in, in retrospect, that, that piece uh, was sort of a um, encapsulation 
of the longer piece that I've been writing. A lot of the ideas of that sort of came together. Uh, the the, the uh, poetry connected. And so it, it felt like kind of a, a, a coda to that. And um, the other project, the one that my last sabbatical couple of years was a choral theater piece, sort of a successor to Bonhoeffer that is focused on um, a religious community on Cape Cod that has a professional level choir at its center. And that uh, piece in the light uh, deals with, because you have this, what is really a mind control, a, a, a coercive control community. I avoid using the word cult because it's so overused and oversimplified, but a coercive community um, with a choir at its center. So by doing a choral theater piece where the choir is the piece and individual characters step out from it, but it's all in the context of the choir would be a way of exploring the dynamics of how people get caught up in uh, coming under the sway of demonic leadership. Wow. Which, which is, you know, I think people can see today that it's not just something that's on the fringe of society, but happens on all different levels. And, and, and as a conductor, it's always fascinated me too, um, the, the, the variety of styles that we use in conducting. I mean, a, a conductor has to be an authoritarian to a certain extent because somebody, you know, I, I put it in the category of it's a tough job that somebody's got to do it. Somebody has to make choices in how the music's going to go when you have a lot of people, um, a, a piece that requires a lot of people to put together. Uh, so how do you do that? And there's a, the full range of how you do that from uh, being uh, ruling through fear um, and uh, the other end of, of uh, a collaborative approach that can verge on anarchy. So, um, you know, where, in between, where is the line between uh, benevolent and malevolent leadership? When do you cross over into uh, requiring that people give up far more than a moment of their musical attention and really give up their moral center, give up their, um, their compassion for their fellow human beings and it can be uh, manipulated into turning on each other. Um, and I, and uh, it, so it was, it was quite a process of getting into the over, that was a six year project. And uh, I spent time speaking with members of the community, visiting the community um, and, and learning a lot about that to try to, to get at that. And that was supposed to premiere in New York uh, with uh, Vince Peterson's group, Coral Chameleon, uh, this coming uh, June with preparation all year long. So hopefully that will happen <laughs> the following year. But again, right now, nobody's, everybody's afraid to plan because you don't know, uh, A, when you're going to be able to start regular performances, and B, you've got to come up with a budget. And in order to do that, you have to have actual performances that you can say, we're going to do this then, and it's going to cost this much. Um, and that, that all takes time. So, but uh, Vince is very committed to doing it. And uh, I feel really good about the approach that they're going to take. Vince's choir is unique in that it has a core of uh, 12 uh, professional singers, and then uh, another 35 singers who are auditioned highly trained young uh, people who do other things, but are highly trained singers. And he, his, he calls them choral chameleon because they uh, perform in unusual uh, settings, unusual circumstances uh, uh, on site um, in combination with, with various elements uh, beyond music, um, theatrical elements. He, he has a musical theater director that he has worked closely with before who's engaged in the project. Um, so it, and, and he just a year ago, he won the um, um, Innovator Award from Chorus America, the uh, right. Michael Korn uh, Award. Oh. So, um, and they're all younger folks. They're like all half my age. So it's like, <laughs> so, 
so that's something to look forward to. But I, I, I haven't written anything, and I'm just now getting to the point where um, I'm feeling a little bit motivated. And I just bought a book of poetry by uh, um, Denise Levertov, who's uh, a, a very, um, she writes a lot of poetry with, with religious themes, um, but it, not in an orthodox way. She's sort of a, uh, a modern uh, female uh, John Donne, if you will. Okay. Um, yes. But um, and with a real ear, and pe a number of people have set her poetry before. But I'm looking to um, to see if there's something that grabs my fancy to write some mm -hmm. simple songs for for solo voice and piano. You give us a, a perfect dovetail as well here. A place where the three of us have some commonality is that, um, well, I'm no longer, but we, we are all Episcopal Church musicians. Um, as I say, I'm no longer doing that, but uh, we, we have that in common. Um, you are clearly, um, how do I want to say this? You are, you are clearly deep into your own spirituality and, and your sense of things. And I'm wondering, and actually for both of you who are still now active Episcopal Church musicians, what it's been like without church in the same context and how you've adapted what you've done, Tom, at the cathedral, Tim, what you're doing at Trinity to um, still have church. And that's my New Hope Railroad. Oh, okay. <laughs> Don't miss your train. <laughs> Either if you want to talk about that, I mean, what it, what's it been like at the cathedral? Well, we we started with streaming for the first few weeks uh, because the bishop wanted to do streaming, and that was the obvious place for him to do it. Um, and we did that up through Easter, and then uh, he mandated, which was a generous thing and wise thing to do, that everybody take the next week off because at that point we were all exhausted from trying to figure out how to do uh, virtual services. And then we, we moved to Zoom, uh, which has worked really well for our congregation because it provides, uh, you can pre-record some things, uh, but you can also uh, have a good bit of live interaction. Um, the sermons are delivered live, uh, the prayers of the people are delivered live and people contribute their prayers to that. Um, doing morning prayer, there's usually five or six different lay people that are involved in doing the readings. Um, musically, the anthem, so to speak, we call a musical reflection, and that is uh, a solo uh, sung by one of our uh, paid singers, either accompanied by um, a spouse or um, not accompanied or using one of the pre-recorded accompaniments. Um, and it's usually, uh, I've, I've been drawn uh, many weeks to the spirituals, uh, a longtime love of mine uh, anyway, but they have a simplicity and directness to them that really lends itself to uh, the intimate conversational kind of performance uh, that uh, someone gives from singing from their home. Um, uh, and, and people really re have responded to that and uh, been drawn into that and, and our, our attendance what, what's been interesting is usually there's dips in attendance in various seasons like the end of the summer or particular holidays and it's just been steady <laughs> because people can tune in from wherever they are um, and and it's one of the human connections that they that they keep going and we even have six or seven people who moved away who in the last few years who are now reconnected uh, to us through Zoom and are on every week. Um, the other thing that it's allowed me to do is I'm part of my role at the cathedral is visual arts. And uh, I've really been loving that because there are, I've, I've, I've always had a love for the visual arts, but um, never uh, could do it myself. Um, but I love talking with artists about the creative process. And there are several artists uh, in the cathedral who, uh, it's a group of 11, who are full-time practicing artists who are supporting themselves through their art. Some in academic positions, teaching art, um, and others through uh, just through selling their work. And some important figures like Ann Minnick, 
uh, and John Dowell, uh, who are both very well established and exhibited um, all over. Um, and I've worked on projects with them in relation to the preludes and postludes. So I will record uh, Wesley Parrott, our organist, playing his preludes and postludes. And then I will use iMovie to uh, use uh, still photography of images of works of art by members of the congregation or uh, pictures of people in the congregation of various activities when we were together or artwork within the cathedral itself without people there. Usually that's the, the, the prelude is usually without people and the postlude is usually with people. Um, but a whole variety of things uh, in a couple of cases like uh, John Dowell, his cotton um, exhibition, which was really groundbreaking at the African American Museum a couple of years ago and, and, and beyond. Um, part of that were photographs taken of um, a village in New York, um, Seneca Village. Seneca Village in Central Park was a, uh, a middle class African American village that had about 250 people who were freemen who were paid wages as, as craftsmen and, and so on and had enough money to buy a plot for themselves and build houses and there were a couple of churches built and then when the Irish immigrants came over some of them got involved and then at one point in the mid mid 19th century uh, they decided to build Central Park and, and they said sorry guys uh, you're out of here and, and it was vanished mm. um, and so it's and it's only recently that people have started to revisit that so um, John did these amazing photographs where he photographed where where the village was and he had photographed cotton in the south and put images of cotton in various arrays and recreated with the cotton and with drawings the shapes of the buildings that would be there um, with current day people walking around in them. I mean they're multi-layered both in terms of being photography and in terms of their 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 meaning and I paired those with uh, there was uh, my daughter lives in in New York uh, lives in, in Chinatown, and there was a uh, Black Lives Matter march that was going from Brooklyn over the uh, Williamsburg Bridge to Seneca Village in Central Park. And she took some photographs along the way. And so I interspersed those uh, with John's photographs and uh, sang the spiritual Plenty Good News as the soundtrack. Yeah. Um, plenty, plenty Good Room. Uh, I'm sorry, Plenty Good Room is the idea that there, there is room um, room for all. Um, so I've done, the, you know, that kind of thing. A couple other artists, I would take one of their a fairly long photograph, the kind of one that you would look at one end and then work your way through. And with iMovie, they have this thing called the Ken Burns effect, yes, yes. which is, which, uh, is a way to, uh, bring movement to still pictures, because if you just put a still picture up on a screen, you'll look at it for a while and then you, you won't engage. But if there's just a little bit of movement, mm. then the eye stays active and stays with it. Um, and my artists have actually really appreciated, uh, you know, it was a risk at first, but they've appreciated uh, taking some of the works and doing this with it because it, it sort of leads the eye. I mean, you make choices about, okay, where am I going to focus the small part and where am I going to, Am I going to start large and go small, start small and go large? And where am I going to, to, to take the eye? But you're really leading the eye along uh, and with music uh, behind it, it, it just gives it, it's another way of looking at it very closely. Um, so, so those are the kind of things that, um, that we've done to, to justify my existence and uh, continue the employment. Did the organ project finish? Uh, well, that's the other thing that's kept me quite busy is the organ project, which is close to finishing. The, uh, um, they resumed uh, actually coming in and, and installing the, the, uh, the new chests and, and, uh, and the pipes uh, four weeks ago. And the, the, all the chests are built and all the pipes are in the gallery divisions but there's five divisions to the organ 
uh, three in the front and two in the back. And the ones in the front, the blower uh, installation had a little bit of a delay, so those pipes are not installed yet. But now that the blower has been fixed, they're going to to go in. So, but that's been a very complicated project to uh, to be coordinating. And I've I, I've enjoyed it because I have in in Wesley Parrott, an organist who is like obsessively thinking constantly about voicings and different mm -hmm. stop combinations and different pipes and the history and all this kind of stuff. Um, but the last thing he wants to do is, is make sure the electrician comes in at the right time. And, you know, it's like rely on him for the expertise and just sort of a, a mediator, making sure all the different parties involved are talking to each other and, and then we get to the finish line. But uh, it was actually played in the service for the first time um, uh, just uh, uh, yesterday, Wednesday, we had an ordination uh, with a minimum of 25 people and uh, Wesley was able to play the gallery organ mm -hmm. for the hymns and for a prelude postlude and it was really uh, quite lovely and wonderful to hear after uh, about six months of listening to our electronic organ, which is now uh, <laughs> gone. And the gallery pieces have elements of our old Austin, which have been restored and are now in the back where only electronic elements were before. So um, when the whole thing is in and the, the white leg molar parts in the front, it's gonna be really special because I think, it, and it's not just me saying this, but I think it will be in Philadelphia, which is a low bar, but the best combination of organ and acoustics in the city. <laughs> yeah. As Tim knows, there are a lot of really bad matches out there. <laughs> um, but uh, you know, either, way oversized spaces or dead spaces with you know uh, but but this the, the quality of this particular instrument and and the warmth of the acoustic i think is going to be a, a beautiful match and and uh, we will be having people listening to organ recitals i'm sure before uh, we're doing any singing in there right. uh, what was funny for me is i sang all the hymns uh, from the stairwell going up to the organ loft uh, with a microphone in front of me Mm -hmm. um, which I could, Matt, I could stay with the organ pretty easily because it was right there, even without Wesley seeing me or me seeing him. Um, but it was a very strange experience. Mm -hmm. Do you have personal favorite hymns? Oh. Out, of, out of the 82 book? I, I'm sure all three of us have, have particular favorites. Are there particular um, favorites? Well, yeah, a lot of them. I guess I, I would say um, the um, Herbert Howell's um, um, all, my hope, uh, uh, all my hope on thee is, uh -huh. is founded. founded. Um, I cer would certainly be up there, but um, but there's a lot of them. I've enjoyed. Uh, I'm almost at my third cycle. I've been there ten years, but I've been choosing the hymns for almost three now, and so I'm almost through my full cycle uh, of the lectionary. And when I'm done, I'm going to sort my Excel file and see how I did <laughs> in terms of, of uh, variety, but I've really enjoyed uh, that aspect of mm -hmm. the job. Well, gentlemen, what else do we want to talk about? Tom, I, I know you, you man, you're, you're focused in very, very specifically focused, but you've got several focuses. Are there any areas that we haven't talked about that are special to you or things that you're working on that that we should touch on. Um, I, I'm thinking in particular again of, um, and this I've known since I sang with you, is your understanding and inter of the interconnection between black and white. I wonder if, if, if there's more you wanna talk about in, in that realm. Well, certainly the project uh, that Donald and I are doing now is, is part of that. Um, my, my philosophy with collaborations and tours uh, from the beginning at Haverford has been that, oh, and, and bef before that, when I was a student at Illinois, uh, Ollie Watts Davis, who uh, I just saw in the alumni magazine is still there and they were just celebrating her retirement, I had the gospel choir there and they were a really, really fine group and I had a church choir. Uh, and I asked if we could do something together with, with her church choir and, and, and we did, and it was a really rewarding experience. And the basic concept is simple. Um, for me, I always, the story I tell is that, uh, you know, they say everything I 
learned about life I learned in kindergarten. Mm -hmm. um, well, at an early age, especially if you if you don't have uh, a brother uh, to play with in the house, you have to learn how to go out and see if somebody else <laughs> is to play with. So you knock on the door and say, can Johnny come out and play? And for white conductors of predominantly white choirs, um, you know, it's up to us to take the initiative to knock on the door of our colleagues and say, um, I'd love to make music with you. Can you come out and play? Mm. And, and then you, you just be patient. You don't be like, we're going to do this and I want to do this. And I want you to be the token, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, music of color on, on this program, but to try to create opportunities to get people together, rehearsing together, singing together, performing together in each other's worlds. Mm. And it's, it's not a huge amount of time involved in that connection, but because of the musical aspect of it, of singing each other's music with each other, in each other's home bases, mm -hmm. um, it creates uh, the basis from which it becomes really hard to objectify people who are part of that race, part of that class, part of that ethnic group uh, or nationality in the future. Because so, so much of our um, divisions today, I think, are the result that we, we live very separate lives from each other and we live in our electronic and because of historic redlining, um, literal cocoons where we really don't have regular normal contact with people different from ourselves. And so, um, you know, I figured for, and, and with, with the college choir, every one of the eight international tours we did involved collaborating with local choirs, exchanging music with them. And the music that we sang of theirs was not the stuff published in American publishing houses. It was stuff on mimeograph back in the day or <laughs> Xerox that they would send over or scan and send over. And then when you got there, you found out how it really went because what was on the page wasn't necessarily, it was always far from the, the full story. But in that process of actually saying, um, you know, I'd, I'd love, can you come out and play? And we'll figure out what game to play. Um, other things can happen. You can stand back and just allow human nature um, to, to take over. And it's not, I mean, the, the, the thing is, it's not um, a Pollyanna-ish uh, kumbaya moments that you're trying to create where you can pretend for a moment that there's no problems in the world. Uh, it's just creating the basis where you, at first, you just make human contact uh, and recognize how much you have in common with people um, that you think are very different from you. Um, and then you learn a little bit more about their particularity of, of who they are. And then the whole idea is, I mean, I always thought of uh, a true education and a good education is one where you, when you're done, you have a high awareness of how much you don't know. Yes, amen. That there's so much out there that you don't know. And so when you have interaction with groups that you hadn't known before, you can know it's harder to make generalizations. It's harder to make assumptions. I mean, we have that temptation often. I mean, for travelers, sometimes the group will travel someplace they've never been before. They come back and somebody mentions that country and say, well, I was there and I know that it's this way. Um, but with, you know, just based on a very narrow experience. Um, whereas what you try to, to cultivate is more that if somebody says something about another country, you say, well, I visited there and um, I noticed other things. I noticed it seems a little more complex than that. That, that seems like an over simplified picture that you're painting there. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you just begin to open up that there's so much that we don't know uh, about each other. That's a, a highly enlightened approach and I, and I applaud you for it, I really do. And as I'm hearing you talk about it, I'm recollecting and realizing this has been a, a main thrust of yours as long as I've known of you. You've always been taking groups out on tour and you've always encouraged um, collaborations. Uh, uh, the, these are clearly, you know, I, I'm finally understanding, Tom, these are kind of guiding principles of yours. And, and I see why. I, again, I, I applaud you. I, I absolutely do. Um, gentlemen, do we have anything else we want to cover here? 
I, I think we've done quite a bit here. <laughs> and Tim, I think we even got some pointers that we can use with our little merry band, right? Yeah. Well, then I guess we've had our conversation. I've thoroughly enjoyed it. I hope you have a great. Yeah. Well, thanks for inviting me. Well, I miss Tuesday nights. Yeah. Um, well, we'll see you. We'll see you next Tuesday afternoon, though. Right. Yes. <laughs> Just going to accompany one of our soloists in uh, Jesus Bambino okay. on the organ, and then we're going to record him playing uh, an intro and the uh, Wilcox descant verse of O Come All Ye Faithful, so that we can have our sopranos in both choirs singing the descant and everybody else singing the melody. Excellent. So. Mm -hmm. And let, it, let us assure you, Tom, that as soon as you post anything about this, we will, of course, post on Cordis Mundi and we will do our level best to, to help you publicize. Um, again, man, I applaud what you're doing. This is this oh, well, we do. a lot of people uh, on the team that are making it happen. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, I think we're out of here. Tom Lloyd, thank you so much. We appreciate it. Thanks, okay, Tom. Thank you. Yeah. Take care.